could all ask you first and foremost to stand up. And then can I ask you to applaud? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's how you create really good content for marketing. Standing ovation, thank you. And now everyone are a little bit activated to start with. So more specifically, we'll talk about big data and how big data is relating to people. We're gonna go into the relevant legal aspects connected and I'm also going to share some insights in relation to the GDPR specifically and how that may affect your work here in Hong Kong. Since we have a legal topic, a small disclaimer. What I see here today is for inspirational purposes only. It's no legal advice. If you're interested in legal advice, you should go and get advice from a legal advisor. So, inspirational purposes only. This is today's agenda. We're going to start about talking about big data and applying the people's perspective on big data. Then we're going to go into the relevant legal aspects. I'm going to provide you with some tools for self-help. And finally, we'll take potential questions that you may have. So, big data. Big data is very much a buzzword. But when I talk about big data here today, I refer to big volumes of data connected from many different sources, analyzed in real time, or at least really fast, for the purpose of providing insight and answering questions that potentially previously was considered beyond your reach. According to IBM, there's approximately 90% of the data that we have stored today has been created with only the last two years. So there's an almost unimaginable amount of data being created and stored each day. And all this data that we collect can of course be really exciting to look into, to find new insights. But what is often forgotten is how much of this data that is actually made of people. I will use an example, Netflix. How many uses Netflix here on a regular basis? Hands up. Quite a lot, actually. Same for me, uh, kind of a Netflix junkie. But Netflix is a great example of someone who has disrupted with big data. Uh, Netflix, as most of you know, is a video streaming service. Uh, which is used by millions of customers worldwide. And to use Netflix, each user needs to log into the system. So the user has been converted and is known by Netflix when they use the application. This enables for Netflix to, in a very easy manner, understand exactly what the user does on the platform. They know if you fast forward, what kind of content you like, when during the day you prefer specific content, etc. And Netflix had all these data on their customers, and they come, came up with a crazy idea. What if we look into the data to try to understand what our customers or users would like to see? So they looked into the data that they had, and they found a big segment of customers who really liked an old BBC drama from the 70s called House of Cards. The same segment also liked, liked products directed by David Fincher. And, at least at that moment in time, they liked things where Kevin Spacey was lead. So what Netflix did was to do an American remake of the British series House of Cards take in David Fincher to direct and picked Kevin Spacey as lead. So it was an immediate success directly and even before the series premiered. And it's a crazy idea. And they have also revolutionized how content and, and, and TV is done today. Previously, 
it was a production company coming up with an ID. Okay, this is a good ID for a show. And then they sold that ID to the broadcaster. The broadcaster who actually owns the channel to the audience. But Netflix flipped it around and as broadcaster looked into the data to see, okay, what does our customers prefer? And then they chose where to invest and what kind of series to create. But, like I mentioned, what is sometimes forgotten, forgotten in these kind of exciting discussions on how analytics and big data can be used is how much of this data is actually made of people. The data that Netflix had was made of our navigational choices, our click streams, usernames, names, and other potential uh, identificational uh, data. And there is kind of a growing concern in relation to how our data is used by companies. So big data equals people. It's important to keep in mind that the people's perspective on big data needs to be implemented in all your communication when you communicate with your audience. It's all about building trust. The Boston Consulting Group has identified what they call the trust advantage uh, in their article on how to win with big data. And I quote, two companies in the same industry using the same data in the same new ways will likely achieve fundamentally different results with a more trusted organization able to access at least five to ten times more data than the less trusted one. This in turn will lead to better online recommendations, more accurate targeting, faster development of new products and services, and other tangible benefits to the consumer. This is the trust advantage. So basically what the Boston Consul Consulting Group says is the more trusted you are and your brand are is, the more data you will receive. The more data you have, the more fine-tuned communication you will be able to provide and the more better products and services you will be able to uh, provide to your customers and that will create an added value both for you, your brand and the end customer. However, we have a trust issue. According to many surveys uh, around the globe, people don't feel trust when they hand over their data online. And this trust issue is something that everyone in the industry needs to work with, um, and especially you guys here as marketeers, to ensure that you build trust in your communication as well as when you collect information. Otherwise, you can basically ruin trust. Here's a good example of how not to build trust. We have, when you enter, Apple store in Regent Street in London, you are faced by a sign saying, your voice and appearance may be recorded whilst you're visiting Apple today. By entering, you are granting Apple Inc. and all its partners permission to use your recorded likeness in all media in perpetuity. Thank you. And then, dear Duncan here says, please Tim Cook and Apple Inc. stop being so creepy. You need to build trust, otherwise you will not get access to data, you will not be trusted with data from people, and you will not get the trust advantage. So big data equals people, then how do you create trust? Well, first and foremost, there are certain legal aspects connected to digital marketing that are very relevant. This kind of finishes the first part when I provide you with a context of what I will talk about. Now we'll move into the specific legal aspects relevant for digital marketing. So there are three legal aspects that are the most relevant to digital marketing and what you're working with today. 
We have electronic marketing, we have privacy online, and we have personal data. And I'll go through these each one by one. When I talk about the electronic marketing, I specifically refer to electronic communications to consumers for direct marketing purposes. Um, in the European Union, we have this within uh, specific national legislation today. Uh, in Hong Kong, as I understand, you have the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance and also the Unsolicited Electronic Communication Ordinance. A general principle in relation to uh, electronic marketing is you should have some kind of opt-in so that the person is informed and has approved that you will send them marketing. Irrespective of the legal aspect, though, please do consider that spam, as such, is very much a subjective matter. If the person receives communication from you more frequently than what the person expected when opting in, that person will most likely perceive what you send as spam regardless. So it's very important to only send personalized information and remove all other noise in the form of generic marketing to that person. You should ensure that when you communicate, it should be relevant, and it should be when the person expects. It's a little bit like what Niklas told us about perception and promise. Apart from electronic marketing, we have online privacy, and when I talk about online privacy, I specifically refer to the usage of cookies. And cookies, or a cookie, is a small text file which is downloaded to your browser when you visit a website. And this text file includes a small, unique identifier in the form of some letters or numbers, which enables the website user to identify you as you move along the web pages on the website, when you revisit, etc. And cookies are used for a wide variety of purposes, for marketing purposes. It can be used to ensure that you are logged into a site. It can also be used for, for example, abandon uh, or cart abandonment, to so ensure that what you put in your cart is actually kept there when you move along the way on the website. How it's solved today in the industry, the the legislation on cookies um, is to have a small cookie banner popping up um, saying that by browsing our website today, you understand how we are using cookies. And then there's a link to the cookie policy where you can read exactly what kind of cookies they use, for what purposes those cookies are used, uh, what you can do if you want to remove the cookies. Well, go into the browser and remove it, and then it's you're not tracked anymore because the text file is gone from your browser. Um, within the European Union, we have this in national legislation um, where it's basically said that it should be a, a consent to the cookie. But how it actually evolved is basically the cookie banner, which is kind of more an implied consent. Uh, here in Hong Kong, you have the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance regulating potential tracking of, of personal data when you use the cookies. But in general, it's the cookie banner that, that rules. Uh, an interesting aspect to keep in mind, though, is that what we have in the European Union today will somewhat change going forward. Uh, we will soon have an e-privacy regulation, which will regulate all kind of marketing communication and other com communication via digital platforms. And what they say in relation to cookies is quite interesting, because basically they say when they introduced the directive, which is the basis for the cookies, back in the 90s, uh, everyone got the cookie banner, and it just popped up on each website when you visit. And it doesn't really add any value, right? Because no one reads the cookie policy. Everyone knows that everyone uses cookies. So why should we do this? So actually, in the... In the, uh, in the uh, preface to, to this regulation, it basically says that, well, most likely the cookie banner will not be needed in the future. We will most likely ensure that the ones who actually develop the browsers ensures that the browser has functionality to stop cookies 
from being downloaded. And that's most likely a much adequate way to, to, to do it, rather than having all these kind of banners popping up all the time. The third relevant legal aspect for digital marketing is personal data. And when I talk about personal data, I specifically talk about data that can be used to identify directly or indirectly a natural person. So personal data can be my email address, anders.hilmansson at apsis.com. That's personal data because it includes my full name and I can be identified by that email. <coughs> When we talk about the personal data kind of frameworks and principles, um, it's important to keep specific definitions uh, in mind. We have the data subject. That's the one to which the personal data relates. Well, that's me in the case of my, my email. I'm the data subject. When I hand over my email to you in a form on your website, you are the data user. I provide it to you and then you will process or handle my personal data. And you are the one who decides why you are collecting it, for what purposes you should inform me why you really need my data. The data processor is then a third party who could potentially be included to help you with processing. If you use a marketing agency, if you use uh, some, some separate system or similar, then that kind of entity will be a, a processor, which is kind of the, your extended arm who actually does the work. But still, you are the one who are responsible. And when you process personal data, it's very important to keep, keep a key principle in mind. Be lawful, be fair, and be transparent. And that's kind of, it sees through everything. The European legislation, also the personal data privacy Hong Kong, uh, ordinance here in Hong Kong, Basically, you should have a legitimate ground or purpose for actually collecting the data. And you should inform the person why you are collecting this data so the person understands what it will be used for, if they won't, don't want you to process their data anymore, what can they do to be excluded going forward. But when we talk about fairness and transparency, and this about big data and data analytics, there's some issues that may arise. And a great example of that is Target. Target is the second largest retailer in the US after Walmart. And Target were interested in identifying points in a consumer's life when their habits are open to change. To ensure that when the habits change, that they continue to be a loyal customer of Target. As part of this project, Target started with a specific side project where they wanted to understand when their customers were going to be a parent. So they used the data that they had. They had a few female shoppers of theirs who had provided them um, with some details that they were pregnant and that they, their expected due date. And this was part of their so-called baby shower registry. So Target started looking into the data they had on the customers in the baby shower registry, and they were actually able to identify specific products which indicated that the person was pregnant. And they also found a correlation between the purchase dates of those products and the expected due date. So having gotten that insight, Target then applied these insights on their every female shopper in their entire customer database to ensure that when their customers who were going to have a baby, to ensure that these customers continued to be loyal customers of Target even after they became parents. And this all came to the public knowledge when a father complained to Target that his 16-year-old daughter, who was still in high school, had received coupons on baby and pregnancy-related products when she was not pregnant. However, as it transpired, the daughter was in fact pregnant, but she hadn't told her father. 
So the father eventually apologized to Target, but it nevertheless, it nevertheless highlights the issues that may arise when you use personal data. And especially what we talked about in relation to fairness and transparency. Was it fair by Target to process and handle this 16-year-old girl's data the way they did? And was it transparent to every female shopper in their entire customer database that they would be processed this way? Maybe not. So keep in mind, be fair, be transparent, and only collect the data that you really need. Ensure that the person has the right expectation and that you don't go beyond what is what you promised and the perception. And when we talk about personal data in relation to Target, this is an example from the US. It doesn't really have the same kind of personal data legislation like we have in the European Union and not in Hong Kong either. But one thing I want to like highlight when we talk about personal data is the general data protection regulation. Um, it's a new regulation within the European Union. Uh, it became applicable at the 25th of May this year. And it basically is one regulation to rule them all. All 28 member states within the European Union. In general, what we talked about personal data and the basic principles of lawfulness, uh, fairness, data subject, data user, it's basically the same. That's an important one to keep in mind. We've had legislation for a long time which is very aligned with what we have in the GDPR. However, some big topics on the GDPR is that it does not only apply to businesses within the European Union, it also applies to businesses outside the European Union if those businesses direct their or offer goods and services to data subjects in the European Union. If you store the behavior of those data subjects or if you monitor behavior of data subjects in the European Union. So it's a very including scope in relation to applicability. The second aspect, which is also key for why the GDPR has become such a buzzword, are the fines. If you're not compliant with the GDPR, you can get fines up to the higher of 20 million euro or 4% of your annual global turnover. What should be kept in mind, though, is that these kind of heavy fines are introduced to ensure that also the big dragons, big companies like Facebook and Google, that they are actually motivated to comply with the legislation, with the current or previous legislation um, and the sanctions available there, there has not really been incentive enough. But it's important to keep in mind, we have the fines and we have an extended applicability of the GDPR. So it may also be relevant for you guys here. I'll go into a little bit where you can find more information if you are interested to get into the details of the GDPR and specifically what you could do. But you can say, the, the general kind of notion I would say, follow the principles that we discussed and if you are compliant with the, the personal data privacy ordinance here in Hong Kong, you ensure that you have a, a legal ground, either that you have a, a specific consent from the person or that you can motivate with a kind of a legitimate interest, which it's called on GDPR, that you have a reason for processing this data, that you have informed the person so they are fully aware why you are collecting and processing this data, how long you will process it and for what purposes. Don't sit around on data for years and years where it's not really needed. You should kind of remove data that is not needed and ensure that your data that you have is, is up to date, is relevant, 
so that you can communicate in a, rel uh, in a relevant matter or relevant matter. Just imagine if Netflix looked into their data today and said, hey, this Kevin Spacey guy, we should make a series with him. I don't think the series would have had the same kind of effect today since he was part of uh, a big scandal this year. Here's an example to make it a little bit more hands-on uh, in relation to how you can set up your customer journey, so to say, in relation to these compliance aspects. So this is customer X, who's uh, really interested to shop something online, a specific product. I don't know what, which one yet, but... So customer X goes to the website, and when customer X this is the website, there's a cookie banner popping up saying that, hey, by browsing our website today, you accept how we use cookies. And then on the cookie policy, you can read about what kind of cookies they have, what purposes they use it, and, and other information, how they can remove the cookies, etc. The person, the customer X, is fully informed why they use cookies, for what purposes, etc. Customer X then goes on the website, they put something on the shopping cart, um, and then for some reason, uh, Customer X fills out the form. So Customer X fills out the form with the first name, last name, email, and Customer X is specifically informed that by providing your data in this form here today, you accept that we will, you accept that we'll use your information to send you marketing for these per, for XXXX purposes. And you also accept that by submitting, you accept how we, we will process your, your data. And this can be set up in a very, very different ways, uh, I would say. If you look into business standards, either you can have it as text box, or in general, I would say most, most have a, a link to a, a privacy policy, and the privacy policy covers all aspects relating to privacy, such as the usage of cookies, some in, uh, information on marketing, and personal data, how personal data will be used, for what purposes, etc. And then for some reason, customer X, or now we can actually, we can stop calling it that customer X, because uh, this guy here was actually named uh, Sonia. So, this Sonia is interrupted, she has the products in the cart, but she's disturbed, so she closes the computer, she runs away, she forgets about what the product she had in the cart. But fortunately, the website owner had, for example, a technology such as Apsys Ecom with the abandoned cart solution. So the next day, an email drops down, hey, you forgot about your product. Don't you want to enjoy the experience of this product? And Sonia buys the product. So then we have a full customer journey where you obtain compliancy, you ensure a good experience for the customer where the perception and the promise is aligned. I promised you some tools for self-help specifically, and I would recommend you highly, if you're interested in these legal aspects connected to digital marketing, I highly recommend you to go into DLA Piper's Privacy Handbook. DLA Piper is one of the largest <coughs> legal firms on the globe, and they provide an online privacy handbook free of charge. So specifically, if you have business in other countries than Hong Kong, or you have sister companies elsewhere, or direct your business towards other markets, you can go into this website, choose a specific, the specific countries you're interested in, and then go and read specifically what applies in relation to electronic marketing, what applies in relation to online privacy, cookies in that specific country, and what applies in relation to personal data. So it's a Good, good, good tip. Use it. So, to sum up, 
big data is people. Ensure to build trust. The more trust you get, the more data you will get. The more data you have, the more fine-tuned communication and better services you will be able to provide. And the more value you will provide to your customers. Perfect. Thank you very much.